It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the films of July 23rd, 1999. And they got three movies to look at today, so let's just go ahead and jump on into it. We'll start off with the biggest new release of the weekend, and um, probably not the best of the three films we're going to look at. Uh, I can tell you right now, it's, probably, it's easily the worst of the three films we're going to look at. Uh, that is, of course, The Haunting. Where reality is an illusion. Where imagination turns to fear. There is no escape. Don't you love it here? From the haunting. Liam Neeson. Catelyn Zeta Jones. From the director of Twister and Speed. The haunting. Rated PG 13. So this is, of course, based off of Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House, which has been previously adapted into a film by Robert Wise in 1963. This is the second time that film that story's been ad ad adapted into a film, Toy Boat. And uh, you have uh, you follow a group of people who are gathering at this estate in western Massachusetts for a volunteer study on insomnia, only to find themselves plagued by paranormal events caused by the connection to the home's grim history. And you have, you see the names there, Liam Neeson, Catherine Zeta-Jones, Owen Wilson, Lily Taylor, among the names involved in here. And this is John DeBond, who also gave us Twister and Speed. And uh, let's just not beat around the bush on this film. This is a terrible movie. This is a horrible movie horrible movie even if it wasn't connected to the original the haunting this is just a bad film altogether and yet it really couldn't have been that way like there was this originally began as a collaboration between steven spielberg and stephen king i mean just imagine what that could have been like if we actually had it that way they actually worked on a new adaptation of this largely inspired by the robert wise version but then after creative differences, they took the project away, and King retooled that script into Rose Red, which became a very successful miniseries over at ABC. And then Spielberg, meanwhile, commissioned a new screenplay written by David Self. And David Self is a name that has written such films as uh, Rope, he wrote World of Perdition, which is a great film. But he also wrote The Wolfman, the Benicio Del Toro Wolfman, which... Yeah, that's not after a good start here, but... Um, I mean, the biggest problem with this movie is just that I mean, just, did you see the trailers for it? I mean, this is literally the thing they tried to sell the movie on. These are its eyes. Won't you come in? Yeah. They thought that was going to be the selling point for this movie. And shockingly enough, that's the best special effect this thing has, because, my God, the, C the overabundance of CG in this movie is just... It's unbelievable how bad it is. Like, it's really, really bad. And it shockingly gets worse than what I just showed you right there. This thing cost $80 million to make. And in 1999, to have CG effects look that terrible, that's a huge problem. But if that was the biggest problem with the film, then this film probably wouldn't be that bad. But no, 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 no. They had to dumb down this movie to a level that is unbelievably terrible that only somebody like the Nostalgia Critic could put it together in a rant so easily but uh since i don't have time to get that here's my little youtube poop pretty much summing up the thoughts on the haunting oh god there are so many complex issues here. <laughs> here. all right and then we're gonna see eleanor literally literally defeat him with the power of love <laughs> oh it's so inspired it's so ingenious hey i don't care if it was laughed off at the disney afternoon i'm the adult i'm the adult i write adult thing but that that's stupid Shockingly, that probably is what happened when they put this movie together, because you cannot be this stupid to try to dumb this story down as much as it does here. Like, the whole th purpose of The Haunting is 
it's supposed to be not like this. It's supposed to be a story where you're not supposed to be told everything that's going on. You're supposed to have these secret elements to it. Like, you're not supposed to know who's holding Eleanor's hand. That was one of the big things in the original film. This, the ending of that film has much more of a meaning behind it. But no, in this film, it's about family. It's about, like, saving these kids that are already dead, by the way. And, like, you know, there's this woman just goes crazy and basically sacrifices herself for no reason whatsoever because, like I said, these kids are already dead and it's, it's like you're going after this horribly rendered CG creation and, like, like, I know I'm not going into as much of a rant as somebody like the Nostalgia Critic probably would have done. Go watch his review. That's done much better. But, man, this is uh, not good. Not a good film whatsoever. It's an abysmal mess of a film which thankfully finally got the proper treatment that it, it is almost 20 years later with Mike Flanagan's The Haunting of Hill House miniseries, which is a massive, massive achievement. It's not only a good re re good retelling of the original haunting story, but it's a pr damn good miniseries. I mean, it's Mike Flanagan, man. The dude is one of the great horror writer creators we have right now working in film. So, I mean, you can't, re you can't really... You need to go check that out. Like it's, you need to go see the haunting of Hill House, the haunting of Hill. Is it the haunting of Hill House or the haunting of Hill Manor? No, it is the haunting of Hill House. For some reason, I thought it was the haunting of Hill Manor, but no. Go watch that. It's far superior. It's Mike Flanagan. It that pretty much needs to be the only thing selling point for that particular film. But um, it says a lot when the House on Haunted Hill, which has nothing to do with this, was a far better horror movie than this than what this was trying to be, and that one wasn't even trying to adapt the, the original haunting in any way shape or form this is just bad this is a really terrible movie and just shows how much of a hack john debont is as a director i mean that pretty much pretty much sums it up right there like guy's not made a lot of great stuff yeah he made speed and he made speed too a great guilty pleasure but twister you know uh this uh actually come to think of it he's not done a whole lot as a director and Last thing he directed was The Cradle of Life, the Tomb Raider sequel, which was not great, but at the same time, yeah, it wasn't anything up to the levels of speed. But um, bottom line is, avoid the haunting light at all costs. Avoid it like the plague. Uh, let's just, um, why don't we move on? Why don't we move on to a film that's bad, but I'd rather watch this than The Haunting any day of the week. That is Matthew Broderick in Disney's Inspector Gadget. scientific research, the United States government is about to turn one ordinary human being French. French. into the weapon of the future. I need more hose! 60 watt light bulb! Careful, careful! He's going into VK! We're losing him! Clear! Now, the world will finally meet the ultimate crime-fighting tool, Inspector Gadget. They will train him. Concentrate. Your mind and your body will become one. Okay. They will equip him. You bought me a car? Just say, go, go, gadget mobile. Go, go, gadget mobile? <laughs> They will make him... I have to hit a couple of overrides. ...a better man. Thanks. Sure. Walt Disney Pictures presents... That's never happened to me before. Inspector Gadget. I don't know what you're up to, Claw, but you'll never get away with it. Cliche, Inspector. I think somebody's been watching too many Saturday morning cartoons. I mean, don't look at me. I'm not the one that made this movie. Uh, and by the way, Rupert Everett, why am I seeing you right now? You're supposed to be in. The, you're supposed to be in cloak. Like we're, the only time we're ever supposed to see Doctor Claw is with his claw hand, and. That should pretty much tell you everything you need to know about how bad this movie is. This is loosely based off of the 1980s TV series in which a man played by Don Adams is 
gift it with these this ma these abilities after he gets is basically here you have the origin story of Inspector Gadget played by Matthew Roderick, which isn't really a bad choice for this, as he attempts to form an evil plot concocted by the series villain Doctor Claw, and basically he ends up getting into an accident, and he basically gets the six million dollar man treatment where he's given all these gadgets and all that, and um, it would have been so easy to just make a simple film based off of that, but um, not this film, not this film whatsoever. I mean, it's it's pretty bad it's no, it's not a good adaptation of the source material and um but in its defense though like i said i would rather take this than basically whatever the hell the haunting was any day of the week but um this film had a lot of problems you see in that trailer there you see a lot of stuff that was not in the original film if you never if you ever saw the original film in theaters the original film was cut down to 78 minutes long uh from an original a uh, runtime of nearly two hours long and you know they basically cut it down after test screenings and a lot of that stuff is on the cutting room floor and has never been shown to anybody and you know maybe if you put that stuff in there then more than likely this probably would have worked a whole lot better um uh like i said matthew broderick wasn't a bad choice for inspector gadget i thought he fit the role well enough but um, what this film could have really been, I mean, I'm looking at some of the development stuff that they have here. Some of the best people in Hollywood were attached to this at one point. Universal was going to make a film version of this in 93 with Ivan Reitman producing it. And, you know, Ivan Reitman could have made this work. When Inspector Gadget moved to Disney, they went to the Fairley Brothers, who were, were going to write and direct it. They even wanted Martin Scorsese to direct it. And imagine the world we could have lived in if Martin Scorsese would have directed this film. But at the same time, how the hell do you go from Martin Scorsese to the dude that directed Cool as Ice? This is directed by David Kellogg, who did Cool as Ice, but um, had more success with the Seinfeld and Superman commercials that aired during the Super Bowl in 98. And uh, Steven Spielberg himself was actually considered to be an ex was thinking about being an executive producer, but he was going to work on Saving Private Ryan instead, which worked out for the best for him. Even the casting, but all the names I'm seeing here probably could have made this a lot better. Like Cameron Diaz was considered for the role of uh, Dr. Brenda, played by Jolie Fisher in this, but she turned it down for any given Sunday, which was probably the right move. Brendan Fraser turned it down on account of working on George of the Jungle. He could have probably made this work. Look at the names. Dave. I'm, I'm going to read the names here. Like Kevin Klein, Steve Carell, Tom Hanks, Tim Allen, Mike Myers, Jay Moore, Jerry Seinfeld, Mel Gibson, Dana Carvey, Michael Keaton, Adam Sandler, Robin Williams. All those pro guys probably could have made this work well. Uh, when the Fairly Brothers, I mean, Steven Spielberg was even considering people like Chevy Chase and Steve Martin. The Fairly Brothers' choice was Jim Carrey. All these names here could have made this probably a much more in interesting film. In fact, Lindsay Lohan even turned down the role of Penny, who's played here by Michelle Trachtenberg from Harriet the Spy. She turned it down to work on The Parent Trap. They had Eddie Murphy, David Allen Greer, and Chris Tucker considered for The Gadget Mobile, and Tim Curry, James Earl Jones, Willem Dafoe, Jack Nicholson, John Lithgow. Tommy Lee Jones, Dennis Hopper, possible for Dr. Claw. Louis C.K. actually even auditioned for a role as a police officer. All the things that could have made this movie really, really cool. And we got this instead. A film that's just gonzo nuts all over the place. But at the same time, it's kind of a guilty pleasure for me. And I don't know why it is. I think it's because of the fact that I have this thing, you know, when films like this are filmed in my near my hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania... I kind of have a little bit of a soft spot for it. I mean, I like Striking Distance. That's a terrible movie, but I love that film because of the fact that it's Pittsburgh. Like, I, you see Pittsburgh in 93 in there. Same thing with Groundhog Day, except Groundhog Day is a fantastic movie in, on its own rights. But, um, I don't know. To me, it's just kind of like, you know, I mean, I see this film, and I know it's bad. I know it's not a good movie. But I can't help it. I just have a little bit of a soft spot for it, really. I just feel like it's a film that... There's something about it that just makes me realize that there's something about this I kind of like about it. I know it's not a good film. I know it's not a great film. I know it's not even a, that there's not even a whole lot of good laughs there, but it's just kind of a guilty pleasure for me. I just can't really guess what underestimate. I can't really say why I like it so much, but um, not even so much. It's just like I don't see myself hating it as much as everybody else does. But like I said, probably because I have a soft spot for it to be John Pittsburgh. And I do like Matthew Broderick in the role of Inspector Gadget. I just wish everything else about this would have been much better. Everything from the casting of Rupert Everett as Mr. as Dr. Claw. Like, 
the one thing you should never ever do is show the villain who's notoriously known for just being shown on screen as the claw. That should have been the first red flag for this film when they said, we can't do that because nobody's going to see who Rupert Everett is. Like, you missed the point altogether. You missed the point altogether by doing this. And, um, uh, yeah, D.L. Hughley is the gadget mobile, by the way. is not that great either. I'm sorry. I like D.L. Hughley, but this was just not up to his levels of, of, of the talents that he should have. But, um, but uh, yeah, it's certainly not a great film, but I kind of have a little bit of a soft spot for it. That's Inspector Gadget. So let's go ahead and move on to our last film we have here. Probably, it's surprisingly the best film to come out this weekend, and pro nobody went to go see it when it came out. And that is Drop Dead Gorgeous. Get a boot job. She's too young for a boot job. They do that at birth now. What are you talking about? Mount Rose, Minnesota. I believe this pageant is an important experience for every young woman. In this town. Our pageant is not a peep show. Oh, God, you fool, Nothing is sacred. Suck it in, or so help me, I'll shove my foot so far. Drop Dead Gorgeous. Doyle, call Joe. Doyle, call Joe. Rated PG-13. So as you can tell from that trailer there, this is basically following the story of a small-town beauty pageant and the fierce, deadly lengths the contestants will take to secure the crown. And you see some big names in there, Kirsten Dunst, Ellen Barkin, Brittany Murphy, Allison Janney, Denise Richards, Kirstie Alley, Amy Adams. Uh, Amy Adams, this is actually the first film she starred in. And um, this is a pretty damn fun movie. I mean, this is a film that not a lot of people have ever heard of. Uh, you have Michael Patrick Jan, who is one of the guys who worked on The State, and he's done a ton of great ma material on that show. Uh, he's done a lot of stuff for Reno 911 as well. Uh, but most notably, uh, the writer of this is Lana Williams, is a name that does not sound too familiar, but she has worked on some stuff before. She was an assistant on The Tracy Ullman Show, which got her a, a writing assistant job on The Simpsons. She actually helped out with the role of Amber Dempsey. See, in the classics of this episode, Lisa the Beauty Queen, she actually provided the voice of that character and also brought in her elements because she used to be a, in a number of beauty pageants as a child and went on to go on to be America's Junior Miss winning a $10,000 scholarship. And she kind of took that idea into the – she kind of took that into this world of, of writing that would come beforehand, writing stuff for The Simpsons, Roseanne, The Drew Carey Show. She also wrote the script for stuff like School, Sugar and Spice and also wrote a very underrated zombie film, uh, Scout's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse, which came out in 2015. So she has made a lot of notable stuff that you probably have, would have never, ever guessed that she was involved in. And the movie is just damn funny. I mean, they got a lot of really good talent in this film. Not just the leading actresses. Uh, you've got uh, Will Sasso, you see there, Nora Dunn, uh, Adam West, Mo Gaffney is in here, Amanda Detmer, Tom, uh, Tom Lennon from Reno 911. I mean, they really stacked in a really strong cast in here. And just the material they're, get, they're given in here is just so damn funny. Like, this is a film that really came out of nowhere. And even for me, it came out of nowhere. I really did not know too much about it. I know my sister used to watch it all the time when we had it on video. And I just remember so many great little one-liners in this film that just, even to this very day, I can still remember them. And uh, they're just very, very funny. But There's just a lot of funny material here. It doesn't go like Heather's route, which probably would have helped Probably would have helped this film. But there are some brief little flashes of some dark comedy and some really good satire in terms of the beauty pageant atmosphere and the aspects and all that. And it's just such a brilliantly funny and smart, clever film. I mean, it's really enjoyable. I think it's a film that was one of those films that was way too ahead of its time. And I think has gone on to have more of an appreciation over the years. And in fact, Allison Janney herself has even said that she's been approached more by fans about this film than the Emmy, the, the Emmy winning role she had on the West Wing, which she won a couple of Emmys on there. She also won Emmys for Mom. And um, that really says a lot when this is more – people recognize you more for this than some of your more notable stuff here. I mean that's a really impressive task there, but – I really like this movie. I really do need to get a physical copy of it on DVD at some point because I really do want to watch this movie over again. Um, I really like this movie a lot. I think it's a very underrated little gem. If you can find it out there, definitely check it out because it really is some very, very funny stuff. Um, I highly recommend it. Drop Dead Gorgeous. And so on that note, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies, and we'll wrap up July next week, uh, next time, by taking a look at Richard Gere and Julia Roberts and their big follow-up to Pretty Woman with the director of Pretty Woman, Gary Marshall, Runaway Bride. We also have the legendarily 
infamous Deep Blue Sea, which it's only infamous because of one scene in particular, but we'll delve into that as we move along to that one. But uh, those are the only two ones we'll look at next week. Um, uh, next time, I should say. I keep saying next week like it's going to be one week from now. It's going to be tomorrow. So uh, we'll have that for tomorrow's episode. So with that said, thank you so much for watching. And if you want to see more videos like this, uh, please hit the playlist on the next page. Check out the previous episode. Also, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this on this channel. So with that said, I am off. I will see you guys next time. And until then, as always... Take care.